way too hot for gases or ices to condense. At these temperatures, they'd evaporate instantly. But metallic particles can condense here, and the planet that forms in this zone is highly metallic mercury. Astrophysicist Steve Desch is an authority on planetary formation. His research has shown him just how hostile a world Mercury must be. It has no atmosphere. It has no oceans. It's just rock. And the part that faces the sun tends to get hot enough to melt lead, for example. It's many hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. The fierce heat is due to Mercury's proximity to the sun. It's almost three times closer than the Earth. Move further out, and the temperature eases a little, by around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, more rocky particles can condense. So the rockier terrestrial planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars, form in this region. Since Venus orbits around 30 million miles further from the sun than Mercury, we could expect it to be a more hospitable place. Venus is probably the closest thing we have in the solar system to your conception of hell. The pressures are immense, the temperatures are high, and it rains sulfuric acid. Around 26 million miles further, our home planet. The Earth has been nicknamed the Goldilocks planet. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. It's orbiting at just the right distance from the sun and that makes it very conducive to life. Earth has a protective ozone layer to shield us from harmful UV radiation and a magnetic field that deflects lethal cosmic radiation. Earth is also the only inner planet to have a large moon. Today, scientists like Gary Lofgren still study the lunar samples first brought back by the Apollo astronauts over 30 years ago. Lofgren works in the Secure Lunar Storage Facility, where NASA keeps most of the 842 pounds of rock brought back from the moon. For years now, scientists have been studying the samples to discover how the moon and the wider solar system may have formed. It's an invaluable resource for geologists, and the Apollo astronauts made it a top priority to bring samples back even if it meant ignoring orders. Neil Armstrong uh, personally made sure that we got a bunch of rocks by basically sort of disobeying the rules, as I understand it, and he kind of snuck out of the view of the TV camera, which he wasn't supposed to do, and filled up a box full of rocks. When the samples are analyzed back in the lab, they soon give up some surprising information. We found out quickly that the chemistry was very different from the Earth, and it wasn't the kind of chemistry we expected from our previous ideas about the formation of the Moon. The lunar rocks, and therefore the Moon itself, turn out to be younger than was previously thought. All the theories we thought of before we went there kind of went out the window really quick, and it took a few years before good ideas began to come forth. According to nebular theory, there should not be enough of the right material left over from planetary formation for moons to form in the inner solar system. It remained a scientific conundrum until after decades of painstaking work, scientists came up with a new theory, a violent and devastating scenario that involved the Earth experiencing a head-on interplanetary smash. 1969, Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon. Only when the Apollo astronauts brought back lunar samples were scientists finally able to understand how our moon may have formed. Their study of chemical isotopes in the samples suggests the moon contains material that was once part of the Earth. It was a totally unexpected find. Scientists were at a loss to explain how this material got there. But eventually, a bold new theory emerges. 
A theory suggesting that in the early solar system, there were not eight, but around 20 planet-sized objects orbiting the sun. When you think about the early stages of planet formation, you can think of it as a sort of a pinball game, where there are these objects that are careening all over the place, occasionally running into one another. Four point five three billion years ago, the young Earth is on a direct collision course with an object named Thea, a body the size of Mars. If we had that collision today, it would probably be the end of mankind. It would be the equivalent of many, many hydrogen bombs exploding on the surface of the Earth. It's a world-shattering impact blasting material with such force that billions of tons of rock escape Earth's gravity and eject into space. This material is captured by the Earth's gravitational pull and enters into orbit. Over a few million years, it amalgamates and becomes our moon. The collision is further evidence of a violent early solar system a period when countless bodies followed chaotic orbits. Often they'd wreak havoc, but some objects became permanent features of our system. The two Martian satellites, for example, Phobos and Deimos, are both believed to be former asteroids captured by the gravity of Mars. These two moons are relatively tiny. Even the larger body, Phobos, is just one-tenth the size of our moon. Although Mars itself is only one-third the size of Earth, it has some of the most extraordinary features in the solar system. Mars is a spectacular planet, a geologist's wonderland. For example, it has the solar system's largest canyon, Valles Marineris, which has side tributaries which would dwarf the Grand Canyon on Earth. It's about the length of the United States. It has the solar system's largest volcano, Olympus Mons, which would dwarf Everest. Mars is the last of the four inner terrestrial planets, the rocky bodies orbiting inside the asteroid belt. That these planets stopped growing at their present day size was largely down to the question of supply. Rock and metal were scarce in the early solar system, making up only around 0.6% of the total material available. Also, the inner planets couldn't accumulate gas compounds because it was too hot for them to condense here. All of the gas compounds condense much further out. Before we reach this zone and the outer planets, there's the asteroid belt to contend with. Science fiction paints this as a crowded zone, difficult to cross. We now know that there are at least tens of thousands of asteroids in the asteroid belt that are a mile or larger in size. Nevertheless, it would be very unlikely if you were piloting your spaceship through the asteroid belt to run into one of these. In fact, we have to aim very carefully to get space probes to visit asteroids. The average distance between asteroids and the asteroid belt is about one million miles. As we traverse the asteroid belt, we hit an invisible but critical border. It's called the frost line. Cross this boundary in space, around 280 million miles out from the sun, and we find totally different kinds of planets. There was a frost line somewhere in the asteroid belt, beyond which it was cold enough for water to condense. And this was a gradual transition, but a very important one. Beyond the frost line, the outer planets take shape. These are very different worlds to the inner planets, and that's due to the kinds of substance that can condense in this cooler region. Colder than minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Hydrogen compounds like water, methane, and ammonia are able to condense, and there are trillions of tons of this material available in the early solar system. But it's only once the outer planets reach 10 times the mass of Earth that their growth really takes off. At that critical mass, 
they have enough gravitational influence to start sucking up trillions of tons of gas. There's a snowball effect. As they get bigger, the planets attract ever more gas. It was a race about how fast these cores could grow compared to how long the gas disks hung around. Jupiter and Saturn just happened to be at the right place in the solar system. They fast become gigantic super planets. And since gas now makes up 90% of their mass, they are also known as the gas giants. Largest by far is Jupiter. This giant planet has a mass over 300 times that of Earth, while its volume is more than 1,000 times greater. According to Hal Levison, we're fortunate that Jupiter did reach this size. The planet's gravity is so powerful, it often changes the trajectory of comets that could otherwise enter the inner solar system. Jupiter actually plays the role of a protective big brother that protects us from the hostile environment that exists beyond um, its orbit. And in particular, there are a lot of these small icy comets that could come in and hit us that Jupiter deflects away, throwing them out of the solar system. Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. It turns out we're lucky it never got any bigger. According to our simulations, if you have two planets the size of Jupiter in one solar system, they will eventually knock out all the other planets. Now, we were close. Saturn is not that much smaller than Jupiter, so we were right on the border of being a stable solar system. Had Saturn been a little bit bigger, we probably wouldn't be here talking about it. It's a terrifying thought. The 